Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Tronson. I'm a licensed therapist here in Orange County, California, who specializes in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder and related disorders. Besides being a therapist, I also have OCD myself. I also serve as one of the IOCF's lead advocates. I'm also in leadership positions on some of their special interest groups. I'm an executive board member, and I'm also vice president of one of their affiliates here in Southern California, OCD SoCal. So I'm going to come to you today from my clinical lens. Sometimes I add some lived experience in there so I can give that as an example versus like, you know, breaking HIPAA or something, right? Um, but mainly I'm coming to you today as a clinician. So the IOCF has created OCD Mailbag. We have so many questions that we get. So if you're not, uh, if you don't recognize me or, or know why I'm answering these questions, it's because Dr. Liz McInville and myself, we host Ask the Experts every first and third Wednesday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I'm from, California, or 12 noon Eastern Time. We also do a Lunch and Learn the fourth Wednesday of the month at the same time. That's where we have a specific topic and guest speaking on that. And we get so many pre-submitted questions to iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind or on social media. So since we're getting questions live and pre-submitted, Liz and I are trying to answer all of them. And unfortunately, we don't always get to all of them. And we started feeling really guilty. So we created the OCD mailbag where we answer those questions we didn't get to live so that we can make sure that your questions are answered. So hopefully you find this helpful. So I'm going to jump right into the questions. I'm going to try to keep this at about 20 minutes so that it is digestible and doesn't feel too long. The first question is, my therapist always asks me what I should do for ERP, so exposure response prevention, instead of suggesting a suitable plan or even challenging. So most of the time, because of that, this person doesn't know how to answer those questions. And instead of doing ERP, they often just talking about the same thing in every session. Is this normal or should I change therapist? Is it possible because my OCD is rare and he has no clue how to help me? What I would first suggest is bringing this up with your therapist. All of us therapists have to keep our egos out the door and we want feedback from our clients if we're going too quick, too slow, if we're being too pushy, we're not being pushy enough. So maybe this therapist, I don't know if it's because he, he or she is unsure. I don't know if you gave their gender, but um, I'm not sure if it's because they don't know how to help or it is a he. If he knows how to help or if he's kind of from the mindset of like, you should be more in charge of it, et cetera. But if you're finding it's not working, I would definitely approach it and just say, hey, I'm at a point in my treatment where I'd prefer you to kind of come up with the specific exposures and me to follow the plan. And maybe once I've gotten a lot more treatment under the belt and I'm in a better place, we can make it more collaborative and eventually I can take it over so I can kind of mimic being my own therapist as I start to, you know, kind of like spread out the sessions. But from your question, it sounds like it's helping now, not helping right now the way it's going. And I definitely bring it up. Now, if you bring it up and there's no change and maybe you bring it up a second time, I don't think it's a bad idea maybe to find a different therapist. And when you're looking for a therapist, I'd bring that up in the initial session or in the assessment or on the phone call and say, I'm really looking for a therapist to kind of help me create a plan and guide me and be in the lead right now until I get better understanding of the disorder and the treatment. That's what you're looking for. And then a therapist can be honest if that's their style or point you to somebody who is. Hopefully that helps. The next question is, is EMDR an effective treatment for OCD? If so, do, how does it work to treat OCD? It's a pretty easy question. It's not. So we want to always recommend evidence-based treatments for obsessive compulsive disorder. And the one that is first line gold standard in most research is exposure and response prevention. Now, sometimes you'll hear people mention ACT, which is acceptance commitment therapy, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, family accommodation, et cetera. These are adjuncts that really help support somebody going through ERP in a way that they may need it. But at the end of the day, exposure response prevention is the most studied. EMDR or um, is a type of therapy that was originally designed for, I, I believe, people coming back from war, so having trauma from war, but they found that the treatment is helpful for trauma. So it's not the most evidence-based uh, therapy for trauma. There's actually two other uh, therapies for that, but EMDR has been effective for some people. I feel there's only been one study I've ever seen that says EMDR has helped with OCD, but there's been no other studies to recreate that. So I have had clients tried the EMDR route for OCD and it hasn't been effective or helpful. So I'd strongly suggest that you see somebody with who knows exposure response prevention therapy. 
If you have comorbid trauma, PTSD, you would want your, your, if you choose EMDR as the trauma therapy, which once again, it's not really the gold standard. There's two others. Um, so I'd look into that uh, uh, trauma therapy. I don't want to go too into it because I know this is, is focusing on OCD, not trauma, but I would work with somebody on the trauma and have them work in conjunction with your ERP therapist for OCD. The next question is, is it better to accept obsessions and let go of them or invoke them and then prevent responding? So take a more passive approach to ERP. They say kind of like an act approach or more of an exposure response act approach. I would say it also depends where you are in your treatment. Bringing on the anxiety and discomfort may not be something you're ready for in the beginning, but after you really get a hang of it, you want to bring that on because you want to be more proactive and you want to bring it on on your own terms. So I know in my own treatment, I found it so much helpful to start to bring stuff on. So what I mean by that is there was a lot of places in my house I avoided because they were dirty or there was family members I thought I was going to harm or I had sexual intrusive thoughts around. So I avoided those family members. I like act. I like the idea of living in your values. And I recognized I was tired of avoiding half of my house and I was tired of not seeing my aunts. I'm Greek, half Greek um, and family's everything. So I felt horrible not showing up to family events or seeing people. So I decided I wanted to start going to family events. I wanted to start sitting in other people, places of the house I once kind of blocked off. And I try to do it often call up my aunt, spend time with her, go to family events, sit on this couch, sit on this chair. So I was actively bringing it on and it allowed me to practice response prevention more and more and more. And the treatment taught me that parts of my house aren't dangerous and seeing family member aren't dangerous. And just because I have a thought around them or just because I have a feeling around the contamination doesn't mean it's real. So I usually see that approach after a while, people get better quicker, they feel more in control and they're not taken off guard. You can take a more passive approach where you kind of just live your life and certain things pop up and you practice accepting the presence, committing to continuing with the activity you did and doing response prevention. I just find a lot of times it's very like offsetting to get, you know, something trigger you when you're not ready, which is going to happen regardless. But at least if you're doing it proactively often, it's not as shocking as it is if you're kind of taking a more hands-off approach. So hopefully that will help. The next question asks, is it plausible that obsessive symptomology is the expression of an intense concern for one's own morality? In particular, deont deontological morality. So deontological morality, can't say that word, just for those that don't know what it means, is the normal ethical theory that the morality of an action should be based on whether that action itself is right or wrong under a series of rules and principles, rather the consequence. So there's a subtype of OCD Typically, we hear scrupulosity, we think religion, but there's a type of OCD subtype that's moral scrupulosity. And that's where somebody's OCD focuses much more on symptoms of doing things that are right or wrong. And they don't always worry about the outcome. It's not always like, oh, bad karma or religious. It, it may not be about going to hell, but for moral scrupulosity, what you're asking about, it may not be necessarily like, karma or something bad is going to happen. It just may be that I feel like a bad person if I don't make moral choices. The problem is when you give into the OCD, it becomes so much more strict and what you're allowed to do becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. I also see people feeling judging themselves and horrible moral uh, scrupulosity, uh, moral um, uh, uh, morality, sorry, uh, moral concern. Um, I see that get really uh, boggled down to the point where people start getting to thought action fusion, meaning if they have a thought, they feel they're bad just simply for having a thought. So that's what we see sometimes it's called like moral thought action fusion. So giving into that, it's not this like, you know, I'm trying to discover like the rules I want to live by a set of principles that I feel makes me a person of value and somebody I respect. Don't let OCD con like confuse you to thinking that's what it is. Instead, for moral scrupulosity, it's where the OCD creates like very start, like very strong, rigid, black and white rules. Can't even have a bad thought. Can't even like say something bad about someone. Can't even think something bad about someone. Can't ever do anything like cuss or, you know, jaywalk or whatever, or else you're a bad person. And then people start to feel bad about themselves and punish themselves and ruminate about how they bad they are. So we see that with OCD. It doesn't mean that all subtypes are around that theme, but that's definitely one of them. So the treatment, of course, is to start look at those rules and say, okay, recognizing they come from an OCD source, not from your own self, and to really do exposures around that. An example with a client that I worked with, we went to Costco without our without a Costco 
um, uh, card. They didn't sell us the candy we tried to buy as the exposure, but it, that felt very wrong to do, right? So I always pick exposures that a client is willing to do. They feel comfortable. I don't feel like that was doing anything horrible or illegal, but it's just having them, you know, practice less strong, you know, morals, not because we are trying to get them to become somebody who's not a moral person, but it's to realize that the the rigidity of it makes them not even want to do or say anything because of it. Eventually, when you get better, you can start to like work on your identity and create a set of principles and rules and stuff that you want to live life by, as long as they're not based into OCD. The next question is, I want to enjoy my life and not constantly need to be in control. How can I relax? You will not be able to relax if you have OCD because OCD puts you in a constant state of rumination, worry, distress, fear, et cetera. So one of the best ways that you can work on relaxing is to really do the treatment and to get better. I think sometimes people think doing ERP makes you more anxious. That is not true at all. Doing ERP gives you your control back. It gives you your life back. And we can't control everything in life. So it teaches us flexibility and trust in ourselves to be able to bounce back if something doesn't go the way we want it. When I had severe OCD, I never relaxed. My brain was constantly scanning for danger. I promise you that if you get better, you will be able to relax. I got really into martial arts and mindfulness after treatment. I loved being able to just sit there and do a guided meditation, listen to a sound machine to fall asleep, focus in martial arts. It felt very spiritual to me. And so I started to be able to relax. I ran gyms, so I got very into physical fitness, which helped me relax. So I promise you the OCD doesn't allow you to do things to relax um, and getting better will. I have great anxiety and compulsions over STIs. Any advice on how to overcome this? So sexually transmitted infections, um, STIs, obviously we know can only be created from sexual intercourse. I see a lot of clients though, however, have a fear just from sitting on a toilet seat, opening door handles, hugging someone, kissing someone, et cetera. I think the first step is getting some psycho education on how to get an STI. I'm always recognizing that I should never assume a client knows how you really can get an STI because sometimes their sexual um, education wasn't very great. So that's where I kind of start. Now, if somebody already knows that I'm not going to give them reassurance, but if they need to just get a little bit of understanding, once we've done that, I start to look at what are all the behaviors that they're doing. So what are the compulsions or avoidances they're doing? That has nothing to do with a realistic way somebody gets an STI. And that's where we're going to practice response prevention. So opening door handles. And look, I don't think of treatment as, as it's not to shock value. It's not um, fear factor. We want to open doors for ourselves. I know, you know, it's it's awesome to have that independence. So it's having them open doors, but response prevention is important. Not immediately sanitizing or washing their hands, using public restrooms, sitting on somebody else's bed. Let's say it comes around masturbation because we see that typically like the fear that I'm spreading, you know, and I could get somebody, you know, uh, sick with, you know, I might have an STI and I might, you know, trace bodily fluids, uh, you know, semen and get it on someone and give them an STI. We know that's not how it's transferred. So as a therapist, I'm going to have clients start to live in the world of normalcy and stop any behaviors that are, we know are not a way to stay safe. Once I've gotten to that point, there's always a risk in having sexual intercourse, right? But we've developed ways to keep safe. We have testing. So you and your partner may get tested. Uh, using uh, protection, whether it's a condom or another, uh, you know, source of protection. It's making sure that you know your partners and their sexual history and not engaging in like risky sexual activity. So I always ask my clients, how come you have to completely forego any kind of sexual intercourse, but other people are out there being safe or they're engaging in foreplay like activities where they're not even a risk of, of, you know, getting an STI. So the guide would then be the next level is being able to find like what is safe, maybe talk to a doctor for them, what should they be using when having sexual intercourse, and be able to engage in safe sexual intercourse. Now that doesn't mean OCD is not going to lie to them and tell them they have an STI. So they got to make sure not to constantly, you know, uh, check for symptoms or get tested. It's, it's recognizing that we can never be 100% sure. We can know that we're making safe choices. Other than that, we can't be 100% safe unless we don't have sex, which then that is a big part of life and we cut that out and then we go to being miserable. So trusting that you can find that balance of being safe, but still engaging in STIs. The next question, just want to check time. We still got seven more minutes. 
The next question is, is there a difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder? I heard that the former, so um, OCPD, is external, so trying to control your environment, acting as a perfectionist, whereas OCD is more compulsions, ritualistic behavior, et cetera. Does OCD treatment help with OCPD? So someone with OCPD isn't going to have intrusive thoughts, doubts, unwanted experiences, and they're not going to do ritualistic behaviors. Instead, it's more of a personality disorder and a philosophy of wanting things to be perfect, wanting to be in control, feeling you can do things better than other people, feeling like your way is the best way, very rigid moral beliefs, religious beliefs, political beliefs. You don't want to hear from other people. You know better. You're the right way. Very like kind of like like compulsive with like money hoarding, not risky spending, not risky behavior. Typically somebody with OCPD does not want to get treatment because it doesn't cause them distress. They actually like being this way and they only experience distress if other people move stuff on their desk or um, other things like that, right? Like kind of get in their way or if they have to do a group project with other people that don't necessarily um, see the same way as eye to eye. So it's a very different disorder. There's no such thing as like OCPD around uh, hit and run OCD or sexual intrusive thoughts. That's not what it is. It's it's very rigid behavior, A type personality, et cetera. The treatment is a little bit different. They don't need to necessarily do the same type of treatment as OCD because it's more of a personality disorder. It's a lot of educating them on why that rigidity is not working. So it's having them see the way that it's impacting their relationships, their well-being, et cetera. It's having them kind of look at the base. It's more traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. So seeing where their kind of cognitions are coming, where their belief system is coming from and allowing them to learn flexibility to more so be able to kind of live in the real world. So I've worked with clients with OCPD. They're typically working in like, engineering or finance, et cetera. And they're really struggling in re their relationships. So them seeing the value in flexibility, hearing other people, listening to other people's opinions, because hopefully their goal is wanting to have better interpersonal relationships with other people. So the treatment's very different. You wouldn't be doing the same type of treatment. It may look like exposures to clients because they may have to go on a vacation with their loved one and not plan it from minute to minute. But I always think with OCPD, you're more trying to teach the person the value of flexibility in listening to other people, being open versus such rigid behavior. It's a personality disorder, meaning the thoughts are egocentric, aligned with belief systems, whereas OCD is egodystonic. Somebody may have intrusive thoughts around bestiality or incest or pedophilia, and that's nothing to do with them as a person. The next question is sometimes I get confused with the difference between distracting myself and engaging in normal life activities once I've con uh, completed an exposure. How can I tell the difference? For instance, after I do an exposure, what do I do? Just sit there or can I go on my friend and call a fr phone and call a friend? So the difference between distraction, I usually say the big five, it's sleeping, it's distracting on like social media and your phone. Sometimes it's drinking, sometimes it's drugs, sometimes it's watching mindless TV or engaging in a mindless behavior. Distracting is I just did an exposure, I'm feeling anxiety and I want this anxiety to go away. I don't wanna experience it. Therefore, I'm gonna engage and usually it's a kind of more passive mindless activity like scrolling on TikTok. So I can distract myself, not have to think of the thoughts and not feel anxious until I've given enough distance from the exposure and I've calmed down. The problem is you're teaching your brain that what you just did was not good and you have to distract yourself with something mindless to calm yourself down. But that does not mean after an exposure, you just don't do anything and you have to stare at a wall. It's asking yourself, what am I doing for the rest of the day? Well, I need to get into a shower. I'm gonna go up, meet some friends, get dinner. Then I'm gonna go to the gym later on. Then I gotta work on some homework and I wanna get to bed early. It's doing the exposure and then engaging in that stuff, but it's bringing that experience with you. It's not trying to leave it at home and distract yourself. It's saying, look, now I got to go to the store and then I'm going to meet up with my friends. I'm still feeling anxious from that exposure and that's okay. You're teaching yourself that you can have anxiety and still function. So the goal is to teach yourself that you can be triggered, but still have a great rest of your day, function, do things, engage in life and not be stuck. So that's the big difference. So always ask yourself the motive. Am I doing this because simply I want the anxiety to go away? Or am I doing it because I really, really want to learn how to live life? All right, let's see how much time I have. I have about two minutes. So I'm going to try to get these last two questions. All right. 
The next question is, as a therapist, how do I do exposures around contamination during COVID-19? Exposures I used to have with clients, I'm wondering if it's okay to do anymore. I would say as a therapist, you want to kind of go with CDC or World Health Organization guidelines and say, okay, what is found to be safe at this moment? So, you know, I never was this type of therapist, but some therapists might have their clients like, you know, touch a toilet seat and lick their hands or lick a doorknob or things like that. I feel like it's not very values based and you don't have to do it, but some therapists want it. And sometimes clients want that, right? I wouldn't do that right now. I mean, I know that obviously we're in a different place with COVID. We're in a lot better place than we were before, but I still wouldn't, wouldn't do that. That kind of stuff there, there might still be a risk. I wouldn't, maybe if a client has a autoimmune disease, maybe not do exposures with their mask off in a super big crowd. So what you would want to do is you'd want to see what is what is safe right now with, with COVID guidelines. What does your area say? And also, is there something to be worried about with the client? Are they, you know, are they confident? Maybe they have a vaccination or they don't have any pre-existing, so they feel comfortable really engaging exposures. So I would focus on making sure to kind of meet those guidelines, the needs of your client and the needs of the exposure. I always remind therapists that you can still get better without doing these grandiose exposures. So for instance, I had a fear of alcohol. I was afraid if I drank alcohol, I'd become out of control and do something risky and get arrested or or forever, you know, my life be altered. I never drank alcohol because I was sober. I didn't want to drink. I was more for afraid of like alcohol in a drink that I didn't know or food cooked out or like touching it at a store. So I never had to actually drink alcohol. It was simply just putting like, you know, my dad's beer bottle next to my food. It was going to the grocery store and being in the aisle of alcohol. So sometimes you can still do exposures without going overboard. That might be risky. All right. So the last question I'm going to answer because I want to keep this digestible and not too long is how do I keep peace in my household? My daughter has OCD and her sisters and brothers feel ignored and that their sister gets special treatment. I'm constantly feeling as if I'm a mediator. What I would do first and foremost is make sure you educate the siblings so that they know why your love, you know, why your daughter is getting a little bit of specific attention. Remind them it's not more attention, better attention, it's specific attention based on what they're struggling with. Explain to them about OCD. I would say it would be good to do a family session with a therapist so that the other loved ones know that this isn't about special attention or she's not doing it to get more attention. She's struggling with a mental health condition. And that's why she needs this attention. Find ways that the loved ones can be informed. We don't want their life to be their, their, their sister's OCD treatment, but keeping them on the outskirts typically makes them frustrated and upset. So figure out if there's a way to kind of engage them in the therapy or the education, get them a podcast, a video, get them in the therapy session, because we want them to have some understanding. Typically what siblings are really great at doing is hanging out with their loved one and not bringing OCD up so that the loved one feels normal and feels like, let me let me rephrase that, everybody with OCD is normal, but feels like their life is much more like somebody without OCD and normal, right? Where they can like just hang out with their siblings and have a good time. As a parent, make sure that you're giving not only like consistent family time, but make sure you're giving individual time with the other siblings so that they know that they can get some individual time too. It's a big thing I hear that parents forget to do. And by spending like alone time with the other siblings doing the things that they love, those siblings may feel special too and say, okay, the alone time that my sister gets, unfortunately, is around OCD, but I get to go get ice cream with mom, et cetera. The other thing is make sure you have family rules. Don't have rules that specifically point out and attack the person with OCD, but have general OCD rules, right? I mean, general family rules. So if the kid with OCD, if your daughter is like throwing things, throwing fits and screaming and yelling and hitting the siblings, it's explained to her that's not okay for anybody in this household. We're not singling you out for having OCD. It's simply the way that you're responding to the OCD and that behavior is not okay. It's causing disruptions in the family and your siblings can't go through this as well. It's checking to see if there's any family accommodations going on. You can go and look up, it's called FAS or the Family Accommodation Scale. You can find it online. It's through Barbara Van Oppen out of USC. You can see if your loved ones, uh, your other you know, um, family members, your other kids, and you are doing accommodation. So sometimes if you pull back on that, the other siblings don't feel as jealous because they're not seeing you do all these extra behaviors for your loved one. But definitely make sure there's a therapist. Inform that therapist about what's going on in the family so that this can be dealt with and healed. Because if it's not talked about, it's going to cause a lot of conflict. Hopefully that answered your question. 
that's where I'm going to stop it for today. I want to make sure that this video is not super long and it's digestible. Um, if you enjoyed what you saw today, remember, you can always see one of our live streams. Go to iocf.org forward slash live. Liz and I do Ask the Experts every first, third, and potentially fifth Wednesday of the month, if there's a fifth Wednesday, from nine, it's at 9 a.m. Pacific or 12 noon Eastern. We also do a lunch and learn every third Wednesday of the month at the same time where we focus on a specific topic and bring on a guest. But we answer questions like this. You can either submit them live and we'll, we'll answer them live or you can go to iocf.org forward slash peace of mind and we'll answer the pre-submitted questions. Hopefully I got uh, thorough answers to this. If not, you can always contact me on social media at Chris Tronson. My email is chrisTronson at gatewayocd.com. You can email me with any additional questions or go to the peace of mind link that I've been saying repeatedly. And don't forget to IOC, go to iocdf.org for all your OCD and related disorders information. I'm Chris Tronson, a licensed therapist with OCD out here in Orange County, California. Thank you for joining me for this edition of the OCD Mailbag. Thank you so much. And hopefully this was helpful. Take care. Bye.